You want to get the right things done for your security program. Sounds simple. But what are the right things for you? What does done mean? And how are you going to get there? Rapid7 realizes more than anyone how hard this can be. While Rapid7's Insight platform offers you industry-leading vulnerability management and detection and response solutions, their focus is on understanding where you are so that they can help you get where you're going. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash Rapid7 to get started. Data protection is a top priority with today's work from home workforce. However, current data loss prevention tools inadequately protect data in cloud or SaaS offerings from insider threats. Secure Circle automatically protects data as it leaves SaaS services such as GitHub, AWS, and Salesforce. The protection is transparent to users and works with any application to persistently protect data, even source code. Secure your data with Secure Circle Zero Trust Data Protection. Begin your 30-day free trial by visiting securityweekly.com forward slash secure circle. Welcome back to Security Weekly's virtual hacker summer camp. Some of you might be wondering how you're going to plan your security strategy without a live in-person black hat vendor expo. Here to talk about that is Ian McShane. He's the VP of product marketing at CrowdStrike. Ian, welcome. Hey, Paul. So good to be back again. How are you? Yeah, it's nice to have you back. Uh, we're in a slightly different hat and in a great shirt. So, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So, Ian, what, what are we going to do if we can't physically walk around a really large floor? I mean, the last time we got to do that was RSA, right? And then everything closed down, and now everything's been virtual. Um, <laughs> how does walking the floor, either in person or virtually, help or not help you plan your security strategy? Well, I say the big thing with, you know, like RSA and Black Hat is just the distraction that come, you come away with it from. Even even as a vendor, when I was an analyst, mm. you go in with these perceptions of, hey, this is what I want to learn about. But you just get screamed at through the hall. You hear buzzwords. You play buzzword bingo with your friends. Mm. And it's just confusing. So actually, do you know what? I think this is actually really good timing. So sitting down, spending time at the, the, the remote hacker summer camp, really, you know, Security leaders, business owners, whoever should be stopping and pausing and trying to figure out, you know, we've made loads of changes this year just to support to the business to get where we are. Which of those were band-aids, which are temporary, and, and where do we need to take them in the future? How do we build a strategy to carry on transacting as a business when we don't know what the next six months are going to hold, right? What are some of the band-aids, Ian? Well, I mean, there's just been this huge overnight business like digital transformation right mm. i think we've seen organizations accelerate kind of three-year plans into three days certainly a bunch of friends i know that not necessarily in the inf information security industry for years their employers were saying there's no chance you can work from home no chance we can't do it not even on fridays not even on bank holidays and then all of a sudden overnight you know they made it work and i'm sure there are a lot of um should we say ropey practices put in place i think there are probably a lot of people scrambling around vpns and we've seen, you know, goodness knows how many vulnerabilities in the last couple of uh, months just targeting VPN systems and, and concentrators alone. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting. Now, the, the Internet reports uh, are not conclusive that, you know, we introduced a whole ton more. Like, everyone didn't go, oh, everyone's working from home. So, you know, we're just going to open up SMB and RDP to the Internet <laughs> and, and call it a day. Thankfully, right? Because some well, of us predicted know. that, I mean. but the, the data shows <laughs> yeah. that, you know, we'll, we have a webcast coming up on that, but the data yeah. does not show, like, that everyone on the planet all of a sudden, like, opened things wide open, which is good, no. we've, but we've learned, yeah. right? I think a lot of vendors did a, a, a really good job of supporting their customers. Like, mm. I know there are a bunch of them, Fa CrowdStrike included, right? We had um, our Falcon Home Use client, which we shipped out real quick for yep. organizations that just couldn't buy hardware quick enough. We let our customers just redeploy stuff without, you know, compressing their licensing or, or, or enforcing license um, controls just so they could keep going in the most secure way. But, do you know, our Overwatch team, right? That's our, our threat hunters. Uh, here at CrowdStrike, they mm -hmm. actually point out that they've seen more sophisticated threats in the first half of 2020 than they did in the entirety of 2019. So although I don't think it, like you say, I don't think it's the Wild West, I think there's been a lot more targeted activity um, by uh, adversaries really you know, trying to take advantage of the fact that folks are working from home and maybe not in the most controlled environments that organizations might like. Right. Yeah, and, but you still have to control the endpoint, right? I mean, regardless of where it is, I mean, people traveled before and had laptops, so we, we still had to cover, you know, the endpoint. And so maybe we had yeah. some more laptops or home computers, but, you know, having even 
just some level of protection on that computer is is a huge. I talk about you know my my son's computer. All my they all share it, right? I built a gaming PC, and even just restricting web browsing, right? With with the home software that I use to you know manage times and things like that. Um, I'm able to actually thwart a lot of attacks. It's like, well, I haven't heard of this website before, so you know what? You can't go to it, right? That doesn't that doesn't work in the enterprise setting, right? <laughs> it really, right. It, it's too much of a, a nuisance to do that. I mean, we can talk about whitelisting, blacklisting, right? I mean, essentially, really what I'm coming down to and what I would be looking for in the Black Hat Expo, uh, actually, now that I, I think about it a little more, uh, based on my recent experiences, are things that don't look like a proxy service or a filtering kind of thing, right? Yeah. I want to remove the risk from the user's desktop as much as possible, <laughs> right? Not just because yeah, I mean, it, it's a losing you, battle. You can't, try, and, and you can't try and funnel it. Yeah, and filtering all that stuff. It's a losing battle. Yeah, I mean, and, and that's the kind of the beauty of, I guess, a, a cloud native, to use a term, mm. you know, that's, that's started to pick up a bit, cloud native um, vendors, right, where we're already delivering this stuff for remote users. We don't care if you're in an office. We didn't care a year ago if you were in an office or if you were traveling. Right? The fact is that it, it works when you're connected to the internet and it makes sure that the enterprise has the visibility and the control regardless of where you are. And, and to your point, I think you know what I would be looking at it as an enterprise is some way really – how, how can I stop things? How can I put a pause on everything and let my team like breathe, right? Mm. My team's probably trying to figure out what devices are where, why hasn't this device connected up for a while? How are we going to plug everyone into SAP when we can't even get, you know, force everyone onto VPNs because guess what? Our bandwidth sucks and we can't really force everyone through it 24 seven. I'd be looking for something that lets me, like you say, offload some of that activity, maybe not all of the risk, but maybe some of the day to day, IT administration, some of the security over to maybe a managed service, maybe a vendor that says, hey, my team aren't going to deal with this right now. We're going to spend time figuring out the future and what we need to do to make this infrastructure last longer than a few more weeks. Right. And how right. can I take away the, the kind of boring day to day stuff that, you know, really we need someone else to take care of? How, how do you balance, you know, what you can, can control in a SaaS offering or cloud offering versus what you may or may not be able to control on the endpoint, right? So if we're virtually walking the floor, like where, where do you gravitate towards, right? Because it, it's, I hate to say, but certainly not the traditional firewall vendors because those don't really help me uh, really much anymore. That's, I mean, exactly, right? The, the, the endpoint is the only thing you can control, right? It's where, it's where your user is, it's where the credentials are. Maybe it's where some of your data is, but it's certainly where the data is accessed. But you need to be able to have that control at the endpoint, right? We, again, I think... The days of being able to guarantee that your endpoints are going to traverse a specific net network mm. are numbered if they're even, you know, still in existence now. And it's interesting doing these uh, interviews, Ian, when you say that, like, are, are users that travel and have endpoints have always been in this risky situation, right? I spoke with researchers from SensePost that were looking at the, the time windows when you're doing captive portals in a hotel room and the opportunity for attacks. Like, yep. all of this is always... <laughs> Has always been there, right? Now it's, I, I guess, just a larger scale. That's a scale thing, right? If, if, mm. if everyone's on an always-on VPN, you know, if you think, it, uh, I don't have any numbers, so I'll be completely guessing, but the average enterprise isn't going to be 100% remote, right? Maybe it's, say, let's say 50%. Now, all of a sudden, every single endpoint device is tunneling through that VPN. What kind of scalability issues are you uncovering there? Can you even do that? I mean, are you having to, like, enforce shifts to cope with data demands? I don't know. Mm. Um, what, what are some of the, uh, uh, you've been at CrowdStrike for a little while now, what are some of the, the newer features uh, in offerings specifically that, that help people, you know, in the situation where we've, we're going to have more people working remotely. Uh, eventually people are going to start traveling again, you know, as well, and it's still going to be in a similar risk level, right? I kind of put the yeah. home network a, in a similar hostile context as you would a conference or a hotel or when you're traveling to other you know businesses for whatever your job role might be right yeah i mean that's that's the beauty of what crowdstrike has developed and delivered over the last seven years it's like that cloud first platform where you can get your day-to-day -day job done no matter where the endpoints are right you can do you can do the it security you can do that on linux you can do it on mac you can do it on windows you've got complete control um wherever that device is and you've got the this 
the kind of traditional protection suite. You've got that prevent, you've got the detection, you've got response. We've got our, I mentioned our Overwatch team, right? Our actual mm -hmm. human uh, threat hunters that will actually go and hunt for threats for you. And then if you really want to offload a lot more of that um, capability while your team's trying to recover and figure things out, we've got like a fully managed service. We've got Falcon Complete, which is totally end-to-end, -end, including, you know, soup to nuts, detection, response, investigation, remediation, and then we'll tell you the best ways to strengthen your security posture to stop these kinds of things happening again. Right. Uh, how has some of the analysis maybe changed when, you know, I'm pulling, you know, obviously the endpoint agents such as CrowdStrike aren't just looking to uh, detect and, and prevent, there's a, a part of it, right? But there's also a, a telemetry and data collection that's happening. When that data comes back and now people are working at home, uh, how do you see some of the analysis changing, right? Because I'm not, uh, I'm not, they're not in a controlled environment anymore. Am I looking, I'm probably looking for different, maybe slightly different things on a much larger scale. Yeah, I mean, as you said earlier, it's nothing's really changed. There's still, there's always been folks that travel. I think what we've definitely seen is the kind of adjacent use cases that people can do with all of that data being centralized. You know, you can use the CrowdStrike platform to do vulnerability and risk management. You can mm. use it to, to enforce um, updating. Anything you can do through PowerShell, you can do through um, in a controlled environment through CrowdStrike's real-time response. So really, we start to see the, the kind of IT operations side of things really being run through the same platform as security operations. Mm. That's really cool. Well, what, what, uh, so what else are we, we, we attending the virtual seminar, right? Uh, what do we miss out on other than like the swag and stuff like that and free coffee? I kind of miss that. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I miss the free coffee. I miss the conference food for sure. But, you know, <laughs> other than sunshine and cocktails, I think the, I think we're going to miss the networking opportunities. I think yeah. that was always the big one for me is, you know, catching up with people that are in the same situation as you. Talking, you know, as you're queuing to try and get out of the, the conference room, conference rooms, right? Actually, can you even... Can you even believe like a year ago, you would have been like armpit to face with 30 or 40 people trying to squeeze through double doors, right? Right. But having conversations about the, the, the session you've just been in and really just learning from other folks. That's what, that's the thing I miss. Well, most, and, you know, that's a great point, Ian, when I, I, cause I've spent a lot of time walking the floors, right? For a lot of reasons. I want to see what vendors are out there. I want to see what they're offering. I want to see if maybe they're a right fit to work with us on the show. If they need, you know, need help getting exposure. So I've got a lot of kind of like mini missions, uh, walking the floor. But one thing that you hit on was sometimes I'm standing there at the vendor booth, mostly for free coffee. Cause that's <laughs> where I gravitate <laughs> towards. Right. And there's other folks that work for enterprises and they're asking questions and describing their challenges. And sometimes just overhearing that and, and being part of that conversation is, is something that I will miss. Yeah, totally. And I've, I've stolen so many smart answers from conference attendees, from enterprises that mm -hmm. tell people how they're doing things. And I'm like, holy cow, I never really thought of doing it like that. Or I didn't think of things like that. You know, I think right. it's that exposure to other mindsets and other ways of thinking is, is invaluable. I think that's definitely something I miss. Right. For sure. Well, Ian, thank you so much for appearing on Security Weekly. Folks that want to learn more about the CrowdStrike platform can visit securityweekly.com forward slash CrowdStrike. Ian, thanks again. Thanks so much. Great to see you. Stay safe. Good seeing you too. With that, we'll take a short break. And guess what? More interviews coming up next. Welcome to Security Weekly's Virtual Hacker Summer Camp 2020. I am your host, Matt Alderman. Joining me for this interview segment is Michael Borohovsky, uh, known as Borski from Synopsys. Now, it's a new role at Synopsys because you were the former uh, co-founder and chief technology officer at Tinfoil, which was just recently acquired uh, by Synopsys. Right. So welcome, Borski. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Technically, always co-founder, but former CTO. I yes, guess. yes, yes. You're right. you're always the co-founder, but former CTO. Now yeah. you're in a, a software uh, a director of software engineering role, I think, with Synopsys. Yeah. So I'm a, I'm a director of software engineering in the in the architecture group now at Synopsys. Yeah. What's interesting about uh, Tinfoil, Paul and I did a lot of research uh, with the Tinfoil folks back when we were at Tenable. And so we mm -hmm. know the product pretty well because we did a, a bunch of research back then when we were looking at application security. Uh, and I thought it was a very interesting acquisition by Synopsys to pull in API security as part of this broader application security portfolio. I think APIs are sometimes forgotten from a security perspective in these kind of new applications. Yeah, no, I mean, that's exactly right. And we're seeing more and more uh, attacks via APIs uh, as, as 
people start recognizing the fact that pretty much everything under the sun now is built using some semblance of backend APIs uh, or some combination of backend APIs. And uh, there wasn't really anything, especially at the time and even now, uh, to look for vulnerabilities in them. I mean, there's been for a while these sort of WAFs that have been applied towards APIs, but very, very little in the way of actual vulnerability detection um, or actual vulnerability assessment for APIs outside of, you know, manual pen testing and things like that. Yeah, I mean, we see the proliferation of APIs all over the place, right? We, we're right. using microservices, so we're containerizing stuff, building out microservice architectures. The communication between a lot of these microservices are a API communication. Yep. We're also seeing a, a lot on the mobile side as well, right? So you've got a mobile application. It's communicating with an API to the backend service. And, you know, when you think about a traditional uh, security test, right, you're thinking static analysis, you're looking at code, you're doing maybe a dynamic scan, but who's really checking the APIs and, and how do you identify vulnerabilities in those APIs? So give us a little bit of an overview of what do you look for and how do you scan for these APIs and these vulnerabilities? It's a really good question, right? So at the end of the day, what are you looking for, right? You're looking for anything that is internet connected that may or may not have a website, right? So imagine embedded devices or even, you know, mobile apps. Uh, if they're talking to, I mean, if they're completely self-contained, you know, if they're uh, uh, some toy game that, that perhaps does... Uh, uh, a Bluetooth uh, connection with friends to be able to uh, use it on, on your phone, that's one thing. But uh, something that actually talks back to some server somewhere on the internet um, is almost certainly going to be doing it over some form or some, some form of a RESTful API or, or similar. Um, and so the, the big question becomes, how do you, you know, we've spent many, many, many years building dynamic analysis tools, for example, uh, to run against actual web applications with actual web interfaces that you can click on things and, and you know, find inputs and vectors and so forth. It's much harder for APIs. And so the thing that you end up having to do is, first of all, you need to take, uh, take an assessment and get discovery done, right? You need to figure out, or, or you can do it yourself, but you need to figure out where all of your APIs are, right? Typically, this starts with looking at the applications that you provide um, and seeing what APIs that you've built underneath that. And then also looking at any anything that you integrate with as well. And then the next question becomes documentation, right? So if you don't know what your API is supposed to be doing, there's no way you can effectively secure it. And so we spend a lot of time trying to help uh, customers figure out, you know, that they, the fact that they need to document their APIs using some sort of common specification. We generally recommend Swagger or OpenAPI. Um, and uh, and then once you're there, then you know where the APIs are, what they're supposed to do, how you're supposed to authenticate with them and so forth. And then you can start making assessments as to whether it's doing what, you de what you've designed it to do, right? I mean, at a very high level, what is a security vulnerability, right? A security vulnerability is a bug, effectively, in which the application does not perform in the same way that the developer originally intended it to. We can't know how an API is supposed to perform unless you document it so you know what it's supposed to do. And then once you've done that, you can decide and decipher whether the API is performing the way that you intended it to or doing something else entirely. Um, or if you missed an edge case. Um, that's kind of where we generally start. Yeah, and I think discovery is probably one of the big challenges right out of the gate, right? How do I know where all these API endpoints are, right? I mean, the developers right. know, but as a security professional for a second, thinking that's outside of the the application development team, how do they even know where all these different API endpoints are? So I think discovery is is one big challenge. Do you have a good solution of, of how do you discover for these APIs as a starting point, just to know what's out there? It's, it's a really good question. And, and yeah, I would agree that, you know, discovery is a really hard challenge. Uh, I would actually, I would challenge you on the assertion that developers know what all of their APIs <laughs> are because uh, most developers don't, right? They use it once, they, 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 perhaps they build some underlying API, but they, you know, they uh, rarely at this stage, although it's growing, they rarely document uh, what those APIs are and where they are and what they're supposed to do and how they're supposed to act. And so as a result, you know, developers, uh, uh, generally have a best guess understanding of what their API is supposed to do. But very often, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll run a scan on one and, and we'll discover, oh, wait, it also has these three endpoints mm -hmm. when, uh, when, when that was not explicitly designed intentionally by the original developer and was simply added later. Um, but to, to, to answer your original question, 
Yeah, there's a number of ways to do it, right? One is you can look at the application manifests and actually look at the source code statically to try and decipher where the APIs are. You can listen with a network proxy to try and see what traffic is being sent where. Um, you can listen with an interactive application security testing solution like uh, like Seeker from uh, from Synopsys will uh, listen on the background as traffic is handled and inform you of you know where it's going and what's happening, um, so you can decipher and discover. Uh, where, uh, you know, what APIs you have and how they're being accessed and, and talked to. Um, and then hopefully start documenting. Yeah. Now, documentation is the second piece, right? Um, I'm familiar with Swagger um, and, and the use of Swagger. If it's not documented, does that limit how much testing you can do against those APIs? Do, do you use that documentation as part of your, your test sequences, or can you actually do a number of tests not even knowing what that, what that API is going to do? Great question. So um, there are some tests that you can do ahead of time without having anything documented, right? Um, you can look for uh, load testing things and, and, uh, and make sure that you can't uh, um, arbitrarily retrieve data from these endpoints without without proper authentication and so forth. But it's 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 effectively minuscule when you think about the greater surface area of, of, of APIs, right? Um, just like with a web application, you know, how how much is there to really glean from a bank from their externals? The answer is very little. You'll end up with a bunch of marketing pages, you'll end up with you know information about various types of accounts and whatever, but you're not going to end up with anybody's actual information. Why? Very simple, right? You haven't authenticated with the application. Mm -hmm. Now, authentication on the web is a relatively well-known or relatively well-defined subject, right? Um, typically, you'll have a username and, and a password form. For uh, APIs, you can basically do anything you want, and it's pretty undefined. And without authenticating with an API, it's going to be very unlikely that you'll be able to glean any useful information. Um, and so, yeah, so the documentation is useful for a couple of things. One, um, it allows us to define how to sign requests, how to authenticate requests, how to literally talk to the API appropriately, um, which is a little bit easier on web applications because they all speak one common language, right? HTML forms and CSS. Um, and so you can ignore the CSS for, effect for, for effective reasons and then think about just JavaScript and, and HTML um, and start parsing the, the page. You can't really do that for APIs. Um, short of things like Hadoos and, and, and so forth, there's no real way to crawl an API. Um, you, it's, it's hard to figure out, okay, now that I've authenticated, well, now what do I do? Where can I go? What, what, are my, what are my options for what to attack? And the simple reason for that is that there is no concept, generally speaking, of, of linking across various endpoints for APIs. There's only this concept of you have a number of endpoints, specifically talking about RESTful APIs here. You have a number of endpoints, and, and you need to document how you know what parameters they might expect, what the types you think they're supposed to accept are, so that we can successfully uh, attack it. Now, there is one exception, which is uh, for some APIs like GraphQL APIs. Um, in that case, documentation actually isn't required, which is which is pretty fantastic. Um, so uh, Tinfoil originally launched GraphQL scanning back at GraphQL Summit last year, um, and then Synopsys now does GraphQL scanning through Tinfoil as well. Um, but the whole the whole idea there is it's it's effectively self documenting, right? If you have a GraphQL API, we can ask the GraphQL API to uh, provide us with its schema via something called introspection, and then we do an, a, a bunch of uh, analysis on our side in order to basically prune that search space and uh, and allow us to to scan a GraphQL API by just handing us the uh, the GraphQL endpoint. Mm, interesting. So a, a lot of the same challenges we had in the early days of DAST in unauthenticated versus authenticated scanning exist in API security as well. Uh, if yeah. you're not authenticated, then you don't know if there's a get or a post or different calls exactly. that are in there to, to know what to test against, right? Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, and it's actually worse with APIs, right? Because at least with, uh, with web pages, you have, typically, you'll have a form of some sort, and you can in most cases, figure out how to submit that form. Now, you know, people do crazy things with implementing SAML incorrectly or, or using, you know, OIDC incorrectly or, or whatever. Um, but that's, those are generally bugs in the implementation. They're, they're you know, they're, there's a, a relatively well-defined set of ways to authenticate with most web applications. Um, I would say, you know, outside of that are, 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 are exceptions. With APIs, there is no well-defined one way of authenticating. Um, I apologize, by the way, they're, I foster kittens and they're just going absolutely nuts in the background. Um, 
uh, the joys of working from home through COVID, I suppose. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, so you know, you have you have these various methods of authentication. You can use uh, various OAuth two types uh, grants uh, for client credentials or, or or password auth and so forth. You can use query head, uh, parameters. You can use header parameters. You can uh, um, uh, sign requests in some other way. There's there's a there's a bunch of different ways you can do these things. And on top of that. Uh, you can combine them, right? So you can use an API secret key and uh, OAuth, right, if you wanted to. Right. Um, and so you have to be able to, to work within this scheme of very configurable authentication schemes, um, which, you know, we, we, do, we, we try to handle uh, through our API scanning uh, by basically treating these various authentication pieces as, as effectively Lego building blocks that you can basically drag and drop on top of one another, and then uh, it'll... it'll uh, apply transformations using each authenticator mm -hmm. to the various requests that we're sending in order to make sure that we're successfully authenticated. Now, <clears throat> one of the big challenges I see with AppSec right now is this concept of DevSecOps, where you bring security into the DevOps CICD pipeline. How right. are you addressing the integration of API security testing into the development process uh, for the developers to, to get a good idea of, you know, do they have vulnerabilities in their APIs? Kind of walk me through where the different integration points in the CI/CD pipeline exist for, for this type of technology. It's a good question. Um, so generally there's a few different, you're right, there's a few different connection points, right? So people will use static analysis generally as they're developing software, right? The reason being that you can integrate with an IDE and things like that, and that's really helpful. Um, but, but where it comes into actual, you know, dynamic testing uh, as part of a CI/CD pipeline uh, happens, you know, during the CI/CD pipeline, right? So when you run your build um, and you are about to deploy it, perhaps it's past, you know, your your linters and and your license checks and so forth. Um, you can kick off a scan with, uh, you know, the Synopsys or Tinfoil API scanner, um, and then uh, within typically a few minutes, discover either you have or don't have any new vulnerabilities. Now, one of the big benefits of API scanning over, over web scanning um, is web scanning can take significant amounts of time, right? Um, due to the fact that it requires real browsers, you have to execute JavaScript successfully and, and replay events and things like that. Um, it can be, it can be, uh, it can be time consuming to be to be thorough and extensive. Uh, with APIs, it's less true, right? And the reason for that is because, well, the way that we built it is is to make it really, really easy to uh, build distributed systems. Um, but in addition to that, uh, it's just a much more self-contained and, and, and well-defined space, right? Um, you don't have to worry about JavaScript. You don't have to worry about browsers. You pretty much only have to worry, generally speaking, about HTTP or, or TCP or some, you know, single protocol. Um, and uh, it allows you uh, a lot more flexibility to be able to make requests faster um, and without having to worry about uh, um, or as much about uh, how, how long the scan will take. I mean, typically we've seen scans go from anywhere from, you know, sub 30 seconds up to, I think, a maximum of about 12 minutes which is perfectly fine for integration into a CACD pipeline. The other thing is that we focus a lot on integrations themselves, right? So we have integrations with Jira, we have integrations with Jenkins, everything that we do is API driven as well. Um, so, you know, if there's anything you can do through the UI, you generally can do it through the API, otherwise we consider it a bug. Um, and so we want people to be able to integrate with, you know, any tool that they want to integrate with, whether it's your CI/CD pipeline, whether it's your issue tracker, whether it's your GRC tool for compliance, or whatever it is that you need to integrate with, we want you to be able to do that really trivially, and uh, and and I think speed is important for that as well. Yeah, I mean, you don't want to slow down the pipeline, right? You can't. That's I mean, right. the developers will get upset if you slow down the pipeline too much because they're trying to get code out the door. So as long as you keep it low touch, you can do some automation and keep the time windows down, now I can effectively do some very good testing through the CI/CD pipeline exactly. to make sure things are more secure. How, how is the Tinfoil portfolio getting rolled into the rest of the Synopsys portfolio? Because I know y y there's been a lot of acquisitions from Synopsys over the years. Yep. I know they're integrating them together in a more centralized uh, platform. How does Tinfoil now fit into that overall um, kind of platform structure? It's a good question, right? So, so 
being on the architecture team, I, I get a lot of purview into this, which is really nice. Um, but to make a long story short, the way that we're kind of thinking about about things is, so we have Polaris, which is our uh, our platform to try and bring all of these tools together um, into into one sort of uh, single pane of glass, if you will, and in one control system. Um, the interesting part about it, though, is the way that we think about it is Synopsys has basically made acquisitions to acquire the best in breed of various verticals in security, right? Now, every single one of these types of tools, DAST included, hey, I ran a DAST company for nine years and, and I'm still doing it basically through Synopsys. And I can tell you there are problems with DAST. There are also problems with SAST and IAST and RASP and, you know, pick your favorite acronym du jour. Um, the thing that Synopsys is trying to focus on and that I think is really intelligent is uh, to be able to take basically the strengths of various tools and have them uh, uh, make up for each other's various and respective weaknesses. Um, you know, DAST can 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 do things to verify vulnerabilities that SAST finds that SAST normally can't verify due to the fact that uh, um, they don't have access to a running application to test against. Uh -huh. um, and vice versa, things that DAST normally can't find, an IAS tool can absolutely find because you know. DAST will never know what uh, calls you're making to your cryptographic library to make sure that you're using a, a, a sufficiently secure algorithm uh, or parameters. Um, but IAST can know that, right? And DAST can exercise it. And, and, and if you can make these tools talk to each other in such a way that they can literally help each other cover up their own weaknesses, thus bolstering their own strengths, um, I think you you have a you have a you have a suite of tools that that uh, fr frankly that'll be hard for any other competitor to beat. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think the, the application security space is so vast in the number of submarkets that are there. I think what Synopsys is doing by bringing all these best of breeds together into a single interface has a lot of value to really get to that kind of yeah. nirvana state of DevSecOps, right? And it, because it is so many different tools. And if you're using, you know, four or five different platforms, you're losing the integration, the ability to leverage the strengths of all those tools. So I think what Synopsys is doing is actually fantastic. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, even with Tinfoil, when we first started the company, we we started with dynamic analysis because that was where we thought was the biggest, you know, need. That was where the biggest dearth of, uh, well, frankly, that was where the, the worst and crappiest tools were. Um, and so we wanted to kind of fix that problem. But our whole goal from the very beginning was to build this sort of suite of best in breed tools. And it was just going to take us forever, right? We were right. we were doing it from dynamic analysis. When we started with building the API scanner. Um, then we moved into GraphQL scanning and so on. And we were going to continue doing that, expanding our product portfolio until we eventually ended up building a bunch of tools that could help each other uh, uh, bridge the various weaknesses and 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 bolster each other's strengths. And then when we started talking to Synopsys, it turns out that was kind of what their vision was mm -hmm. too. Um, so you know, it, we were we were very excited to come in and, and help uh, and, and and basically continue building that same vision. Yeah, it, it was a great acquisition. Uh, Borsky, thank you for joining us on this interview segment. Of course, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, you're welcome. And if anybody wants to learn more about Synopsys, please visit securityweekly.com forward slash Synopsys. And with that. We're going to take a break and we'll come back soon with more interviews for Virtual Hacker Summer Camp.